We are going to get to our, our mental health question in a second, but the panel asked me to ask you some questions with your little cards. I lost my cards already. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. I don't need it. So, how many of you uh, know the concept of progressive realization? Green card, if you know that concept. Progressive realization. Now that you guys are, this is not playing the game right here. You guys. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you put it all at the same time instead of waiting to go first. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. That's good. You're ahead of me. You're, you're trying to save time. Fair, fair, fair enough. What was the other one you wanted me to ask? Um, legitimate restriction of rights. Oh, yes, yes. The, the derogation or legitimate restrictions on human rights. How many know about that? Okay, so we're going to get into both of those things in a second. But, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. One third one. How many of you are familiar with uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child? And, 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 and why the United States has not ratified? Why we're the only country in the world that hasn't ratified? How many know that? Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Then we're going to definitely and, and talk how about many that. Taking health and human rights <laughs> <laughs> How many intend to take? Doctor Grown wants to know how many took his course on health and human rights. Uh, actually, <laughs> let me let me ask you. You can start answering the question. How do you reconcile? state power in psychiatry with forced treatment of the mentally ill? That's a very good question. <laughs> Can you repeat the question again? <laughs> so good that is, I can't it, Is it ever okay, uh, not a violation of human rights, to force yeah. psychiatric treatment yeah. with drugs or other or seclusion yeah. on a mentally ill person? Yeah, I think that you've got to separate off Safety, if somebody's harmful to themselves or harmful to others or unable to manage their life, that's one question. The second question is treatment. So I, I think it's fine to separate, you know, when necessary for the safety of the patient to uh, commit them for their safety. But then the question of treatment is a different issue, and that relates to whether they um, have, have had, a, you know, make a substitute judgment as to what they would have wanted in the past. and whether we have evidence of safety and efficacy of treatment and monitoring. Usually we need some kind of outside surrogate guardian or whatever to protect their interests. But I have no problems with forced treatment if, that if that's going to lead to successful treatment. Success. All right, yes. Well, this, question, this question actually is linked to the other question you raised of derogation. It is. Legitimate derogation. Go ahead. And so we're going to comment, where, comment on that. Yeah. Some criteria have to be applied. Maybe Sophia wants to go through. At least there are some criteria that were developed in Syracuse um, back in the 90s. Earlier. Earlier than the uh, 90s. Whereby um, some specialists in ethics, in law, in human rights got together and said, um, is asked the question, I mean, under what sort of condition, uh, meeting what sort of criteria, can there be restrictions of human rights? And the first agreement was that there can be restrictions if they are legitimate, but they will not apply to all human rights. For example, you cannot legitimately restrict the right to be protected from torture. Things we have as war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's right. So, Never. Hmm? No, there are none. There are, there are, can you say it, please? Non-derogable rights. But say, most rights, particularly in the economic, social, cultural rights uh, cohort, can be subjected to, um, res to restriction. They can be restrained. But they have to meet a certain number of criteria, such as they, the restriction has to be based on a legitimate objective. Legitimate meaning that there must be some some science behind it, or some plausible assumption behind it, that if you do that, you are going to protect health or protect national security, as a matter of fact. The second criteria would be that it has to be um, for a limited period of time, strictly necessary in the way it is applied and in the length of restriction of that right. For example, typically in uh, the flu epidemic, um, association, freedom of association was restricted. Um, free, uh, the, uh, um, the right to education was restricted when some schools shut down. Uh, the freedom of uh, free movement was restricted when some areas were 
sort of you know out of reach by some populace and so forth. So that um, is uh, legitimately acceptable, but it has to be uh, for a limited uh, period of time. Then there should be no discrimination in that. You cannot say, well, um, uh, restrictions will be applied to LGBT, but not to the rest of the population. Um, and so it, it has to be equally justified, equally applied through the population. And then there must be um, um, accountability. It has to be in, a, in accordance with the law. So uh, typically a bureaucrat, uh, district officer cannot decide on her own that she's going to impose restriction of rights. There must be a legal uh, instrument behind that give, gives her the um, authority to do that. Um, so that in, and, in, and it in, should be the least restrictive alternative, yes? At least it should be the least restrictive alternative. There is a long list, actually. It's so a long it, list. I'm uh, impressed. Yeah, got yeah, to, yeah. It's got long, to. But um, that responds in a, way, in a way to your question here. Can you impose a treatment on someone who creates a risk for herself, himself, or for public health? Uh, yes, there is a mechanism, but it cannot be decided on just by the treating physician in yeah. that in that so setting, it has to have a judicial process um, that uh, complies with the norms, the so-called uh, criteria. Thank you. And, and ongoing monitoring, if, assuming one does yes. institute the restriction on liberty, that one needs to Should get rid of it as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. So the restriction. Yeah. Sophia, did you have something? To um. Yeah. No. I, I think. No. I think I'll let it be because I, I, let's move on to the next. To, to the to the next thing. Okay. Let's uh, let's do the convention on the rights of the child. And I ask Sophia, why why hasn't the United States ratified that? I mean, it really does seem that we're out of touch on this one. Uh, do, we, do we hate our children? Is it family values? Of course we hate our children. Okay. Of course that's why. Um, I mean, there's obviously the politics of it, and there is the there is the the misinformation that's put out in terms of what the Convention on the Rights of the Child is about, and that misinformation is put out on a regular basis uh, in such a way that it inhibits uh, genuine debate and genuine conversation as it would happen within the Senate. I mean, essentially, the United States has signed but not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it signed it uh, under Bill Clinton. And uh, that means that because you need the advice and consent of two-thirds of the Senate, it means that each year uh, the convention comes back up for discussion. And so, but the problem is, is that the lobbying is very strong that, to ensure that it does not happen. So there's the politics. And the, in the politics, there are, there are two uh, areas that I think are, are important. One is that there is the misinformation that's set up that says that the convention uh, it, because it sets up a direct relationship between the child and the state, that it, it moves the parent out as the decider in terms of how it is that, that families ought to operate, which is in fact is not true. But it, it does set, however, uh, a relationship directly in terms of a legal obligation on the part of the state in terms of children, in terms of school, in terms of health, in terms of education. But I think, to be fair, there is one particularly damning thing, which is fantastic about the convention, but also perhaps at a, at a legal, for, from legal perspective, why uh, the United States has a very difficult time ratifying. And so I need to give the on, that honest piece as well, which is that uh, the convention, because it was the first human rights treaty that was drafted at the end of the Cold War, the way that the language is drafted, it actually imposes both the negative obligations that the state, that the United States is comfortable with, and the positive obligations that the United States is not comfortable with are tangled in the same right. And the best example of that is the right to life, which has both the right not to have your life arbitrarily taken from you, which is something the United States is comfortable with, but also your right to survive and develop, which is language that you were using. And that language of survival and development has economic implications. And so because of the economic implications, it comes back to the discussions around health care and the United States and what we're willing to take on and not as an obligation. I think that it's much harder to take a reservation to that uh, provision because the provision, the 
it's so tangled. And so I, I need to say that, that there is that as well. Tell them what a reservation is. Sorry. Apologies. Um, a reservation is when a, a government says, we agree to be bound by this treaty, but only in so far as we do not agree to this very specific part of it. And we say this part does not apply to us. But this, it's much more difficult to do in this context. And some, some reservations you can't make. Obviously, they're in direct contradiction to the convention. I don't want to get too yes. carried away, but we talk a lot about equality, so let me ask, uh, why haven't we signed the convention uh, to eliminate discrimination against women? Do I get that one too? Yeah. Oh, anybody can have it, but you can take first crack at it, because you did so good on the rights of the children. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so one That's of almost incomprehensible to me. Right. I'm glad. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I think again that, that there is, I mean, one of the things that, that's been interesting about it politically is the fact that um, it's, it's been made, Bill Clinton made it part of his presidential campaign promises that the convention would be ratified when he was president. That clearly didn't happen. Um, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, essentially whether Hillary Clinton is going to come very strongly about whether ratification of the Women's Convention will be part of her campaign. She hasn't yet said, stated anything, but it's one of the things that I, that I and a number of people are watching to see whether or not she's going to take that on, or Bernie Sanders for that matter, but like how people are going to take that, um, that on. Um, I, I think that what I would say about, about the Women's Convention is, is that it's There is an argument, which is an arrogant argument, that what is in the Women's Convention is already protected under national law. And that therefore, there isn't the need for us to agree internationally to something where nationally we are already protected. And that we don't want other countries looking at us to make, to see whether or not we're in compliance. And there is, I think a real problem with that argument that I think probably everybody in this room has, but I, I do want to say that it is a very real argument and it's certainly one in terms of conversations that I've had with people who are involved in those conversations seems to be quite important. So I'll put that out and then open up other reasons that people might want to add. Oh. Okay, thank, thank you for both that. Um, I want to open it up to all of you. Just one, one more, one more question that we didn't answer the progressive realization question. So, uh, let Danielle. You know, how can like resource poor countries be expected to have a right to health? <clears throat> it can be resource poor countries. It can be also resource poor states within a country. I mean, are, that also have the obligations in certain settings to provide or to create environments that are conducive to better health. And when resources are lacking, there is a provision that applies particularly but not exclu exclusively to economic, social, cultural rights, which is that there is a tolerance for states to gradually, progressively deliver their obligations. But there are a number of conditions for that. They have to assign to the particular health issue or health-related issue to the maximum of their available resources the means for progress in health towards this particular goal. So there is first a notion of maximum available resources um, towards that goal that need be mo mobilized. There me needs to be benchmarks and targets set by the country saying um, over the next five years, this is how we are going to progress towards that goal. And this need be monitored and reported on. Um, the resources in question uh, can should include resources from domestic origin, but also resources that can be generated internationally. So it is perfectly all right, and uh, another human rights, which is the uh, human rights are an obligation of international cooperation. Uh, countries that are better off financially have an obligation, in fact, to help countries move towards those goals. And, uh, so that's the concept of progressive realization. Um, in, in just a, great, a thank few you, words. Sophia, as a comment. No, just just a quick, just Hopefully a quick a disagreement. No, no, no I, <laughs> unfortunately, not a disagreement, but not yet. Okay, but just just um, the 
that there's a, a really marked difference between incapacity and unwillingness. And I think it's really important to recognize that in terms of the differences among states. And that if the, that unwillingness is unacceptable, but incapacity is understood. And as a result, this concept of progressive realization is therefore really important. But I think the other comment I want to make about progressive realization is that it's not only about lower income countries. And there's always this recognition that wealthier countries can continue to do better and that it can extend to what they do in terms of development assistance and cooperation as well. So it's both doing better for the people within your borders and what you do outside. So I want to make sure that progressive realization is for everybody. But we're the best in the world. Of course. In the United States. Yeah. Well, what Even though we have to make our health care system great again. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we took the convention seriously, um, and then ratified, we would have to then admit that we are unwilling as opposed to incapable of doing, it, of doing this. Yes, fair enough, fair enough. There, there are two in, at least in Western Europe where I live, there are two areas which are totally neglected by current governments. One, but not all governments, there are a few exceptions. But autism is an, is an issue that's totally neglected. Uh, the number of children with autism grows expon exponentially year after year, and the facilities to take care of these children with great outcome when they are really cared for um, are just not there. So there is a, uh, a neglect to a large extent. And then the second is aging and the associated um, older age uh, diseases for which there is no system that's being put in place with this wave of Elderly people, well, I, mean, I belong to that wave, so I'm uh, concerned myself, but there is nothing, nothing in, the, in the plans that um, prepares for that event. So. That's why we have physician-assisted suicide here in this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, we're, gonna, we're opening it up now. There is, uh, again, wait for a, uh, put your hand up, wait for uh, a uh, microphone, go ahead. You know, they'll come to you and just, just give us your name and uh, then ask a question, okay? Hi, um, my name is Kristen. I'm a Global Health Concentrator, MPH. Um, I just was wondering, um, you guys talked a lot about the different laws and conventions, especially like the UN and the broad. And I've, what, at least in the global health sphere and, and kind of what I've been learning, is that a lot of times these laws might be in place, maybe on an international level, maybe on a country level, but then you get into the country and nothing is going on in that space, whether it's you know health, human rights, and how. So how do you deal with that? How do you help countries, you know, create these programs to maybe help with that? And like, what do you see as the challenges and potentially the opportunities for improvement um, and what we can do? Let me ask Sophia to answer that first. Is that all right? Sure. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you got the most experience. You and Danielle are the most experienced yeah. here. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think one of the things is, is that law is necessary but not sufficient. And so one of the things for me automatically is not to say that they shouldn't have the laws. We need to make sure that they're there, and then we need to be able to point out how they're not, in fact, being implemented. And so one of the issues then becomes being able to understand the effects of the law not being implemented and to be able to show in health terms, not just in rights terms, why, if it's a good law, like why it is that it's problematic in terms of the health outcomes that you're trying to achieve. The, the flip side of that is that there's a lot of bad law that remains on the book. It's true. And then one of the questions, I mean, there are still sodomy statutes in a number of states in this country, right? So there are bad laws that remain on the books. And the question is whether you also, as public health professionals, are concerned with getting rid of bad law, right? Once you start in engaging in that legal sphere, you need to be thinking about how it is that you work with law and the extent to which you make law part of your work. I would just, just extend on that in saying that there are situations where you don't necessarily want to change the law, uh, although it may be a bad law. I'll give you examples. Uh, opioid substitution therapy to treat people who are injecting drugs, which has spread not, uh, not opium use or opioid use, but OST harm reduction programs have spread very widely in the Asia Pacific region. And this was against the laws which pre prohibited any use of methadone or any support, support programs for drug users. But the governments realized that they needed the evidence to convince their own politicians or leaders that harm reduction worked before changing the law. 
So they, many of these countries had to operate um, in an, an illegal context, but with a sort of tolerance from the states. And, and gradually the laws are, are changing now. On that, just on that as well, just is the fact that in, in many countries, particularly in Latin America, where abortion is illegal, the state turns a blind eye because it's illegal, but they recognize the services need to be there as long as they're provided by others. And so it's a, it's a similar kind of example in terms of that. So. We'll just move around the room. I'll do one in the back. Hi, um, my name is Chloe Warren, and I'm an undergraduate student aspiring JD MPH student as well. Um, so I had a question specifically for the special rapporteur, but also for the rest of you. Um, I saw a billboard once that said, parenting is prevention. Um, so I wanted to sort of speak to your, you know, when you were talking about early childhood um, and the right to life and also development after that. So in countries or regions or states, what have you, where the life expectancy for parents is rather low or the, where there's high mortality for parents, what are your recommendations in terms of health care of those children that are left behind? How do we deal with health care for orphans? Can I rephrase it that way, Chloe? Okay. What, what rights do orphans have for health care, if any? Very different are regions. For example, in Eastern Europe, 94% uh, of children in orphanages are not really orphans. They have at least one parent, but because of some tradition of state policy, again from that other extreme, the decision was made that state is a better mother. So. If something wrong in family, let's uh, institutionalize child. And uh, um, now, now it's a huge burden. St still, thousands of children in Eastern Europe, and in some uh, e new EU countries, sadly, uh, e even EU funds are, are invested to improve these institutions instead of uh, developing alternatives. Alternatives are clear, support for biological parents. If this is not working, then foster parenting, adoption, national adoption. Um, in other countries, like develop, de developing countries uh, with, uh, as effect of HIV, AIDS, and other epidemics, yes, there are many orphans and many institutions where children are li li living. There are uh, good uh, UN gu guidelines from 2010 about alternative care of children. And it's very clear uh, decision by UN in these guidelines that at least during first three years of life, a child should be in, in, in should live in family, uh, biological or other family because the living in institution uh, is, is detrimental to his or her uh, development. Um, in my in my um, uh, report on early childhood, I recommended to lift this to five years, just just to do something to 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 lift this this from three to to five years. So uh, I I think that. Uh, uh, we should get rid uh, of institutional care, at least for, for small children uh, all over the world. It's possible, but again, there is a lot of need for, need for, for political will. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Anybody over in this group, oh. we're next, if you guys. <laughs> okay, I got one. Okay, let's go. Uh. Hi. Uh, first, let me incriminate myself. Sorry, introduce. Uh, I, my name's Fez. I'm a, um, a health law concentrator. My question was to the special rapporteur. Uh, Early in your presentation, you said that your office functions independently from the United Nations, but uh, I'm, I'm going to assume, and perhaps I assume too much, that your office is still funded by the United Nations. So how independent are you? And I guess that... 
opens a broader question about how independent is the United Nations itself, considering most of its funding comes from, you know, America, and America tends to get America. its way. Yeah, and America tends to get its way uh, when it comes to the United Nations. So, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can tell them you're not funded at all. <laughs> That's right. There's uh, two of us here, me and uh, Juan Mendes, we uh, represent special procedures mechanism, which oh, we are so-called mandate holders. Um, there are thematic mandate holders like us, and there are country rapporteurs for some countries which are in some special list. Um, and also, uh, yes, and, the, uh, and uh, about support, uh, as I told already, the UN uh, Human Rights Council appoints special rapporteur, special rapporteurs, and uh, this is non-salaried position, so we are not uh, members of staff, we are not uh, part of UN, uh, we survive from where we live and work, and our other life, I mean <laughs> our main life, and this is uh, just we commit, when we apply we commit up to th for three months during one year to travel, to, to report, and, and uh, support comes from uh, Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights. I have one, uh, one person of, from staff who is uh, supporting me. And then it's up to uh, rapporteur to arrange uh, to affiliate with some university. I'm affiliated with, with, with the University of Essex. University of Essex applied for grant, received grant from Open Society uh, Foundation to support my mandate. And from this grant I have another person. Uh, Juan Mendes maybe have m more uh, is more experienced, maybe has more uh, support persons or grants, I don't know. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, I think it's not the worst system. Uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to imagine how this, uh, how you can survive without uh, uh, funding, uh, but this is probably price of independence. So. If you want to be independent, you do not depend on anything. But then it is some, some threat that nothing depends on you. Uh, <laughs> if you're just a lonely, <laughs> a lonely thinker who is, you know. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, this is uh, a meaningful, uh, meaningful uh, activity. Thank you. Yes. Okay, yeah. Hi, my name's Ben Gray. I'm from New Zealand, uh, so I'm an outsider. Um, my question really is, I absolutely value the whole idea of, of human rights, and of course it's a process that's been great, uh, but with rights go responsibilities, uh, and those with the greatest power have the greatest responsibilities around human rights. If you've got no money, no power, no political place, you can't really make a difference as to whether anyone follows any human right, and conversely, those with more power. And I wonder whether we've spent too much time focusing on analysing what the right thing to do is, and not enough on who has the power, and what is the process to change it. And uh, sitting here watching the American political system, I'm astounded at how broken it is and how it is unable to represent the people in America. It represents those who have power and there's some very, very powerful people here who run what happens. Um, so I wonder whether we should be focusing more on what we do about power rather than on the detail of the yep. exactly what the rights are. I know. Great. Fair question. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about economics being the real driver during the break as well. Comments on that? Well, I we may face a bit of a dilemma here. On the one hand, it, it has struck me that presenting um, many human rights, specifically including the right to health, as touching on all of the social determinants, for example, the fundamental drivers, is a way to engage um, the entire population. It's a lens through which we can recognize opportunities to um, improve 
say, educational programs and um, orphanages or get the appropriate mental health care and the like. But the dilemma we may face is that if that's politically attractive, it also dissipates responsibility because if everyone is responsible, like health and all policies um, appropriately seeks to do, if everyone is responsible, then no one is responsible and everything can fall through the cracks. So many of us are searching for the, uh, the appropriate levers to, it, to gain the kind of traction and political traction that is necessary without entirely dissipating the power. I don't necessarily have the answer. I would also add, I, I mean, I, I think that there's the question of what, what your starting point is in the conversation. And I'm thinking from the perspective of, yeah, in terms of the general framework, I fully a thousand percent agree. But then I think if we're thinking about public health, we're thinking about health outcomes. And we're thinking about how is it that we best address to be able to improve health and well-being for populations. And within that, I think there's a very clear role for thinking about human rights and the role that rights can play. And yes, at, at kind of the upstream, we can be dealing with power structures, but I wouldn't want to avoid and ignore what the human rights system can offer to improve health in order to be able to address those larger political and powerful forces. So I just. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back over here. Go ahead. Hi there. I'm Quinn Hirsch, and I'm a health law concentrator and an MPH student. So we were talking about how human rights are enforceable and I think there's a real balance there between how we enforcing how we enforce them through naming and shaming and whether we put burdens on lower and middle income countries and economic economic sanctions so I was wondering if you could discuss uh, enforcement mechanisms of human rights procedures and goals and how we shift the burden so that it doesn't become burdensome to follow good ideals Yeah, you want to take that one? You, you don't have to take I it. Can, I, can <laughs> I can try the beginning of a uh, response. Personally, I think that um, some aspect of human rights, the right to health, remaining in the, in the realm of uh, the right to health, are enforceable, but not very many are enforceable. Um, there are some examples, such as the Tobacco Framework Convention, that have imposed on countries to take certain measures, legal and otherwise, and report on uh, what they did. And that seems to be working to the extent that countries are stimulated in the right direction. The tobacco lobby is, of course, working against that and trying to slow down the process, but it's an area where progress is being achieved, there is no doubt. And that has been done in a relatively soft fashion by not imposing a new convention, but a framework convention, uh, telling countries, you know, if you want to reduce tobacco consumption among your young people, these are the things that you could consider uh, building in your laws. So it's, in a way, enforcing the right through proxies, the proxy being the government itself. That seems to be working, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to clarify how we think about what enforceability is. And I, I think that the, that the sanctions piece is just a piece of it. And so I, I think that, that really what we're talking about in a bigger way is accountability. And I think that the, the notion of accountability and the framework of accountability as that is used and how we think about, for example, the use of rights to help governments, those governments, do their jobs better to be able to use rights to prevent violations from occurring in the first place. So that it's not only, so I, I wanna be careful that we're not in enforcement land as the way that we think about rights in the context of thinking about what it means for health. You wanna be the public health police? Is that yeah, that? yeah, we're not, that we're not, and so that, that we're broadening it. And I, I hope that that, and there are many examples of governments, lower and middle income country governments, far more than the United States, who take on rights very consciously in how it is that they do their work and are able then to be able to show evidence of the value in some ways in terms of what the implications are for the work that they do. Yep. 
Hi, um, my name is Chaya Bhuvaneshwan. I'm a practicing psychiatrist and MPH, and I really appreciated the discussion about coercive treatment, rights to be committed versus not. And I just wondered, um, one of the dilemmas that I feel that we've encountered, even you know, like within academic systems, like the Harvard system where I've been practicing, is um, you can commit someone, but one of the barriers to treatment is that you don't necessarily have a structural or legal obligation to provide a therapeutic environment. Um, in the sense that the ability of institutions to truly provide a therapeutic environment, a non-traumatizing, non-violent environment really varies. So I'm wondering if you can suggest sort of within the human rights debate of whether or not it's legitimate to commit people for involuntary treatment of any duration or nature, is there also some legal obligation to make it an environment that is, you know, free from various dangers, pressures, because within clinical psychiatry, we're not necessarily seeing that. It's, there's so much variation as to how dangerous a given environment is. So just wondered, I'm, I'm sure I'm not articulating that well at all, but I'm just wondering if you could help us, you know, even begin to create a language where we can start to raise these things in clinical settings. Yes. Thank you for, for these thoughts. I just want to add what I <coughs> told earlier. I think it's a good time globally and, and nationally to discuss the uh, possibility of new paradigms. There have been many paradigms in psychiatry and in mental health uh, changing all these shifts of pendulum maybe two extremes, but from after each, uh, with each new paradigm, things were improving, including with the human rights. It means that it makes sense to have new paradigms. And uh, now this crisis I, I see as opportunity because uh, uh, there are serious questions, for example, maybe similarly like you're raising, this uh, concept of dangerousness uh, the, the critics of this concept tells how, how you know that, how you know the future. How, can you see the future? Well, because I'm doctor, the answer. The answer, the only answer, because I'm doctor. It's a, a, a little bit too weak argument, I think. And uh, also uh, the, the concept of medical necessity, because I'm doctor and I know, and I know that it will be better. How do you know? Uh, so th these are serious questions. Again, I'm not fully convinced by, by the side which is opting for full ban of non-consensual treatment, because as a doctor, I cannot imagine what to do in some special cases, yes? But maybe to apply common law? I don't know. But the, 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 then, we, then I need good lawyers. <laughs> and, uh, but. Uh, uh, but this this situation with this pressure from CRPD, from human rights advocates, and with this crisis in in biological psychiatry, and with appalling conditions in most of psychiatric institutions in many countries, they are really very very sad. The the question is whether where is worse in prison or in mental hospital. So very sad question. Uh, in 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 middle of Europe, we discussed recently with a group of psychiatrists. Central Europe is famous for cage beds. Have you heard about cage beds? They put people in cage cage beds. And Eastern Europe uh, and Eastern Europe, which was surprised, people from Eastern Europe telling to this former Austro-Hungarian <laughs> Empire countries, why are you so retrogressive putting? people in cage beds. The answer from colleagues was because we see this as lesser evil to compare what you are doing in Eastern Europe. You over-medicalize and chemical restraint is worse than mechanical restraint. So this is debates going on in 21st century in Europe. Should we close to the cage or should we over-medicate? So 
this means for me that some, something is wrong. And, but for this psychiatric establishment has to recognize the crisis. So far, this has not happened. And uh, leaders of global psychiatry, they, they are taking defensive approach that all those who are criticizing us are, are wrong. So um, I, I would like to contribute to this. But, but uh, the problem is that there seem to be no chance for compromise or consensus because the positions are very polarized. Thank you. Under, under, under the guise of protecting people's liberties and, and their freedoms, we de deinstitutionalized, which was an excuse in many ways not to deal with the problem. But again, the, not, not only people get, got, went from the institutions to prison, but to the, ho to the homeless on the streets. And so we've ne neglected our responsibility to have a system in place to deal with the mentally ill who can be de dealt with outside of the institutional setting. And I don't want to turf this to this afternoon, but we are going to talk a lot about mental health in prisons this afternoon. But go ahead. Just to maybe to, to extend the uh, very complex issues you are raising beyond the realm of uh, mental health. Um, in mental health, you are dealing with people who are assumed to not be capable of making decisions for themselves or for the protection of others. But in people who are assumed to make decisions um, um, logically, if you will, the problem persists. For example, in a discordant couple, HIV discordant couple, where one is infected, the other is not, if one refuses protection or if one refuses to take ART as a means to protect the partner, is there an obligation that you can invoke to make sure that the patient is treated? Likewise in TB, when someone, as was the case, uh, someone who had an active TB and was actually uh, prevented from traveling overseas and was arrested, but he was a lawyer, so he could fight his case and said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll continue my travel. It's the, but there was an attempt by the CDC. It was an attempt. He actually traveled and came back, and then he was arrested. <laughs> yeah, that's why he traveled. <laughs> It was not an active TB. So, no, it turned out it wasn't at all. It was a misdiagnosis. <laughs> that's right. So these situations raise um, very complex human rights and legal issues as well, although involving people who are deemed to be able to take rational decisions. Sophia? Yeah. yeah, and I just wanted to respond kind of on, on the question around whether such an obligation could be created. And, and I, I actually think it's a really good idea. And, and it's one of the things that I, I think is, is sort of interesting, which is as we think about how do we build these legal claims, and I think one of the issues is to be able to think about, uh, for example, the ways in which we look at the um, rights people have to a safe and healthy environment, the ways in which we take that, and if we can build the legal claim on the positive affirmative in terms of what's needed. And it seems to me that really there's no reason not to do it. It's just that it hasn't yet been done. And so it's a question I actually, as you were talking, thought that wouldn't be so hard to do. But I, I just have never heard anyone try to articulate it in that way. So I'm happy to have a conversation afterwards if that's useful. So. Professor Glass, do you have a question? Hello, I'm Leonard Glantz. So you referred to um, the rights that uh, people might have have to do with the resources in the individual uh, countries. But I'm wondering who gets to determine that. It seems to me all of this stuff has to do with the distribution of wealth. Um, so um, the amount of resources available for health or education or housing is a choice. That's usually made, that, that can be made by uh, governments. So, for, for example, uh, India, I think half the population doesn't have access to toilets, and yet they do space exploration. Is that like a human rights violation to say because that money could be used for um, toilets? and for health rather than something else. So when we say that resources, with the availability of resources, how do you determine, how does an external body determine what are available resources within a country? Um, you were members of a member of a treaty monitoring body, or maybe it would be worth uh, raising the issue of monitoring those issues. There are four actors involved here, the government, 
accountable in theory to its um, constituency. The uh, civil society who do monitor, who are supposed to have the uh, option of monitoring what the government does and how they set their own priorities. The so-called treaty monitoring bodies that receives reports regularly from the government on which questions can be raised and the government would normally respond to those questions and reading the report from the government it may turn out that it's very clear that the government is not investing in what would be producing more health than what what is happening there is a new hospital being built up but there is no water sanitation in most of the rural areas for example and so the question can be asked why is this and the government has to find a justification and so, and, and there, the civil society can also contribute to the report by producing what is called a shadow report, I believe, which is the perception by civil society of what the issue is and how the government is appropriately or not appropriately responding to it. So uh, there you are, and you have UN agencies as well that can provide rep country-based reports. So you have an array of information, and there is no... Um, systematic system to score the, the report on the government saying, you know, it's 90% it's, it's right and 10% uh, wrong or whatever, but at least there are various sources of information that can be gathered, compared, and can, um, uh, in the form of a short report going back to the government, criticize their, their option in terms of priority setting. Would you say India was wrong, though, in Leonard's hypothetical that they spent all this money on space exploration and none on toilets. Excuse me? Was India wrong to do that, what they did? To go into space exploration where their health care system is so I'm, terrible? I'm not aware of that, but uh, okay. it's possible. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah, we can take a question down here. Where's our microphone? Uh, hi, I'm Farnas. I'm a fourth year medical student. Um, and I had a question um, uh, for the special rapporteur about um, how discussions about health and human rights and the right to health varies internationally and, um, and the effect of such variation on the fulfillment of these rights. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about Iran, which has a very robust public health system. And one part of the rhetoric of the revolution was that um, we are all brothers and sisters of one another, and so it's you know part of the state's obligation, um, you know, to in, in have this strong public health system. But then Iran is also um, around the world criticized as uh, you know not being a strong supporter of human rights. Uh, so, just would be interested in hearing your perspective. So another way to put it, can you have health, government health without human rights? It's hard to say. You know, the country, one of the countries that had the best score world, worldwide when it came to public health was Cuba. And Cuba at the time was not known for its uh, open attitude towards human rights. Um, there is actually a Preston curve, which you probably know and learned at school, showing that um, there is no relationship between the wealth of a country and the way they produce health. You know, that uh, you can, like Cuba, with minimum health investment, have a great return. Now, if the same country outside the health sector violates human rights, um, I mean, the, the only thing you can say is that there are mechanisms to monitor and detect. Maybe we can ask the special rapporteurs how they would handle a situation where they travel together to Iran, and one says public health is great, and the other reporter says, yeah, but there is torture there. So how does one get into a dialogue with the government saying, you know, you are doing so well in public health, why are you doing it so bad? In the... And I'm not, I'm not saying that about Iran. I've never been to Iran. So I... But a hypothetical country could have such a situation. I also cannot comment on Iran, but uh, uh, some experience from, especially from CRC committee, uh, maybe I will contradict to what I told uh, earlier. Uh, um, I remember one dialogue which was very sad with one, one country which is among, among those who 
I have very very bad uh, performance in human rights, and uh, I could not feel any meaning you know, of that dialogue because the delegation was uh, refusing to um, recognize any problem and threatening that if we continue committee raise questions, they will leave the room and so on. So I, I was asking my colleagues, more experienced colleagues in committee, what are, you, what are we doing here? What, what are we doing? Why, why, why we cannot then openly tell them <laughs> you know, uh, that they are just... Uh, uh, okay, so they, th the, my experienced colleagues told, you know, when you, you are mental health, child mental health professional, well, well, when you uh, have family which is not performing well, do you moralize them? Do you tell you are bad parents? No, 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 I told. We try to do something to, 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 <laughs> to make them a little bit better. So this is the same uh, how we uh, have to deal with governments. Because if you just name and shame, they will come home and be worse after that. So the only way is to try. This is why when you read reports from committee, for countries which maybe are not not among the West in human rights and so on, in the beginning you can read uh, co that committee commands for this and for this and for this, and this is part of diplomacy. But and then and then committee tells, but maybe you can do something something better. So I I am not sure if this works, but uh, but this is attempt attempt to improve situation in, in, in each of the countries. Can I also just jump in on this? Quick. Yeah, j just on <laughs> terms of, I promise, um, not. That in terms now pressing of, on lunch, so okay. you gotta be careful. Um, no, but, but I think that one of the issues is, is having a, that if, if there's a country that claims a very good health system, one of the first questions is then, when you recognize who are the most marginalized and discriminated against populations are within that society, do they have access? And if they have access, are they able to use those services in a way that does not then contribute to further violations of their rights? So that I think that there's a, there's, there's a cycle there in terms of being able to look at it. And I just wanted to make sure that that's in the conversation. So. Thank you. And before we end, no, no, I'm gonna ask each of you if you have a final comment or question you wanna leave our group with, yes. you don't have to, but if, if you do, I know Wendy wants to say something anyway, but we'll start with Wendy. So my comment as a follow-up is that's exactly the kinds of questions that we need to be asking in the United States. Um, and that's why the human rights approach, I think, makes a good lens through which to evaluate our healthcare system. Um, it's not some bizarre other country, but we need to ask as what are we doing for the least, um, those who have the, are the most disadvantaged and the least that will give us a good read on where we need to improve. Okay. Michael? Here is a certificate for, uh, here at Boston <laughs> University School of Public Health. A little advertising uh, here. Uh, on, right. so, on social justice, <laughs> human rights, and health equity, which is terrific, <laughs> but, uh, by the way. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> and if you really want to learn more about this, you could take health and human rights. And you can spend 15 weeks <laughs> discussing these matters. Trying to answer these questions. Danielle? Uh, my brief comment will be on something we did not really discuss in great detail. But the fact that uh, I, I am convinced that the boundaries between public health and medicine are blurred now. And they are, they are vanishing. From, and thanks to medical students who are doing public health in the course of their studies, thanks to your dean, who is both a clinician and a public health person, uh, thanks to many of you who have uh, interest in public health because they realize that you can't achieve the goal of treating a patient and his family appropriately if you don't look at the context and the determinants of ill health and of positive health. So that, I think, opens the way to a new concept of medicine and health. And I'm, I'm very glad it happens because in my generation, there was indeed a barrier. And if you had to call on somebody to become an expert uh, advising the government on a public health issue, you would go to the university hospital and find a surgeon who could come and uh, with a lot of credibility speak to the government. That was the case, it's less and less the case. You were saying this is still happening in your own setting, uh, Danus, but I hope that will change during your lifetime. Okay, Sophia? Um, 
just that, just to, to, to grow on the public health concept for a moment, which is that I think that one of the things that's really evolved is not only that we now think about being a public health professional, bringing in medicine, but we recognize the importance of law, the importance of people who are lawyers, the importance of people who are economists, the importance of people who are social workers, the importance of people who come from a range of disciplines. And part of how we now understand public health is about how all of us learn how to work together. And I think that the diversity of who the students are here is super helpful in terms of kind of being able to think about that. And so I appreciate very much who, when I heard who the people are who are speaking, it's very helpful in terms of how we think about what is public health. And the, the last sentence on that is that human rights is then and also a language, a discipline, a framework that allows disciplines to work together. And so in that way, <clears throat> I hope that hearing what we've had to say is a way to actually be able to think about perhaps how you might forge some alliances that maybe you hadn't forged before. Dennis? Well, there are many paradoxes in uh, this whole area we are speaking about. And some people still expect that medicine will develop and miracles, uh, you know, new miracles will be invented and all, all diseases will be cured. And I am, I am so unhappy when even in good textbook I read, there is no cure from autism so far. What, what but we'll want, get there. <laughs> what they want to tell by this? I am a little bit, I am, I am anxious. What, what they mean by, by this? Uh, so, and in 19th century, there was a uh, person, father of pathology, uh, Rudolf Virchow, and he told, medicine is a social science. So I, I think that uh, medicine would win very much if it, uh, if through medical education and through uh, healthcare systems would be more friendly to modern public health, human rights, and social sciences and not expect just through specialized expensive healthcare services uh, to, to solve uh, healthcare problems. I think this, this is illusion. Great. Thank you all. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you all.